All right. Welcome to this uh, very special installment of Conversations with You um, episode. I have here Paul Robson of the uh, Manifesto YouTube channel all the way from Denmark. How are you, sir? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much and uh, honored to be here. Yeah, likewise. I appreciate you uh, spending some time with me here. And um, what's how, so how are things in Denmark? Is are you from there originally? I'm born and grew up in South Africa. Okay. Uh, I've lived in five different countries, actually. Uh, but the last 18 years here in Denmark, uh, where um, it's heading towards summer here. Nice. And uh, really just seeing like I'm, I'm a little bit out in the countryside and everything's gone really green. Uh, and then there's these beautiful big fields of yellow rape flowers uh, mm. all around where we're living. So all the fields are just like transformed to yellow in this, just this last three days or something like that. Wonderful. Just... It sounds beautiful, actually. Yeah. Um, where is your family from South Africa, both sides? Yeah, both my parents and grandparents are, um, we have a complicated history, but it's like originally British Dutch descent. Um, but my family considers itself very South African. Yeah. Oh, interesting. My wife's family is, uh, from South Africa as well, from Cape town mm. there and, Great. um, Dutch too. My wife is hundred percent Dutch. Actually. Yeah. Her, her opa, uh, was from, um, Holland, um, you know, and they came from South Africa. They got half of the family, most of the families in Canada now in South Africa. And then, you know, a couple of scragglers here in Florida. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. I have a brother in Canada up in Toronto. So uh, really? <laughs> we're already spread out. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. I don't know what's in the water in Canada, but if you notice, like when I, when I develop conversations or things that I'm interested in, most of it's coming from Canadians like Jonathan mm. Peugeot and Jordan Peterson and Gad Sad. Marshall McLuhan. I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, oh, I didn't know Marshall McLuhan was uh, Canadian, actually. Yeah, huh. he's Canadian. Uh, oh. Yeah, his, his grandson, uh, Andrew, who's a friend of mine, we, we had a couple conversations. He still lives up there in a small town. And um, Marshall McLuhan actually said, it kind of addressed this of why Canadians have a sp certain perspective on what's going on in America, because they're like, uh, they're far away enough like they're looking over the fence. They're not like involved in the kind of insanity and they can objectively kind of have a perch to look at it. So I think that's why us here in America, we're actually like paying attention to what they're saying. Cause it's like, okay, they're actually making sense of something that seems uh, chaotic. They're kind of bringing some order with their words to it. So it's interesting. Um, yeah, it's really interesting perspective. And especially the work that we're doing. So working with men's work, it's like, we have a lot of American inspiration as well. But then we can see like, oh, there's a very different approach here in Europe. Uh, yeah. That's often not as well known in the Anglo Saxon world as well, because of the whole language barrier, of course, but yeah, yeah, definitely. Now, when you you've been there 18 years in Denmark, so uh, how old are you? If you don't mind me asking? I'm 39, uh, 40th birthday coming up actually in just a month. So, oh, well, happy, yeah. uh, happy, happy birthday coming up. I'm actually 39 too. My, uh, 40th <laughs> or similarities, up, right? 40th <laughs> is coming up in December. So very cool. Uh -huh. So wow. you grew up, you grew up what your early adult times in Denmark. Uh, I moved here when I was, yeah. What was the, what was I then? 20, 21 or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So where were quite... you? Um, when you were, let's say, uh, you know, your early teens and into your teens, where were you living? Living in the middle of the desert in South Africa, called in a town called Bloemfontein, uh, a okay. real Afrikaner town. Uh, went to a school called Grey College, which is the third oldest school in South Africa, very traditional. Uh, they call it the factory, produces a lot of <laughs> rugby players for South African, the South African rugby team. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, what was it like going to school there? <sighs> hmm. A lot of discipline, a lot of focus on discipline. It was tough in many ways. Uh, I grew up in a fairly conservative Christian home. My father is a pastor in a, in a, in a church. Uh, and so um, was not always easy fitting in uh, with, with the other guys as such. But as I, as I grew older, especially getting into my teens, then I, I adjusted and I, I fitted in, I would say. I, I didn't play rugby, uh, but I played field hockey. Uh, and I was on the school debating team. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was really sharp at like, you know, kind of, uh, and I did well in, in especially in, in, uh, academically, I did very well in school as well. So I kind of found my role and, and my niche. It was a boys only school. Mm. Uh, and I was one of the few boys who managed to make contact to a girl somewhere in, a, in the local school and had a girlfriend. And that obviously got a lot of street cred yeah. as well. Back then. 
Mm-hmm. So what is uh so what does fit in look like? What was the kind of the general ethos of adolescent kind of masculinity back then? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I think what was held high was certainly strength and um, kind of aggression and dominance. Uh, was was there was there was definitely, I would call it institutionalized uh, bullying uh, in the school. So. There was um, a, it was called initiation uh, Mm -hmm. and younger boys were kind of systematically uh, trained to know their place uh, as well. And so, and and that was the kind of model that was done. And it was, it was partially kind of approved of by the teachers and and the school personnel as well. Actually, it it, was done in full light of day, um, but, and, and quite harsh at times, but also kind of taught you to really understand in a very physical way, the hierarchy that existed uh, Mm -hmm. at this Mm-hmm. That's interesting. I went to, um, so I live here in Florida in a, uh, a large Greek community here. And I went to high school, which was, uh, you know, right in the, in the middle. And we had something called the Greek corner where you would, uh, if you, you know, a freshman, you would get initiated into kind of the Greek clique, right? By being jumped into like a gang, not really though, but you would be kind of initiated pretty hardcore and then you're, you're taken care of. Um, and yeah. it's interesting that you have that you've had that in your background and I have that too, but you don't see that in America in general. Like, I mean, it's not as overt, I guess there's other different ways. I mean, if you're uh, going to hang out with the partiers, you're going to have to, you know, do some drugs and drink. That's kind of your initiation. Yeah. Uh, so it's, yeah. it's interesting. I think that's one of the things that's, that's what, one of those things that's part of the structure of the world and of reality that's been lost. Like for example, in Greece, you have to go to uh, military for two years as a man. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's a sort of uh, initiation. And there's a lot of those in different cultures. And that seemed to seems to have been lost in the West. And I think that is a, a large um, a problem, so to speak. Yeah. So what's your experience with that? <clears throat> yeah, well, I mean, we so we the first two weeks of school, we had to like dress in our full like suit and tie and cap. Uh, you had to have instead of your normal school suitcase, you had to have like a really big suitcase that you carried around with you with all your books in it. And then you get given tasks by like the matrix who are the 12th graders, right? Uh, and they would tell you to do all kinds of stuff and you just had to basically run and do it. And then they, we would meet up uh, every, uh, I can't remember, I think it was like Tuesdays and Thursdays after school. And then we'd have to sing songs and you'd have to like really sing really, really loudly. And then they would sometimes make you do ridiculous silly things. I don't think there was anything that really went overboard um, too often, but sometimes it got over a bit, a bit uncontrolled, I would say with like, you know, some aggression and pushing guys around and stuff like that. Um, but, but really, as I said, I think it was, it was like a, a getting a real concrete experience of, of there's a hierarchy and there's a set of values. Um, the school's motto is, I can't tell you what it was in, in Latin, it was, but it was nothing is steadfast, which is not true. Uh, so, so in order to be steadfastness comes through strength and, 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 it, and it, it, there's a very old tradition at that school. And so, um, so I, I certainly know when I was there and especially those early years, I hated it. Um, but, but I, I also looking back on it, I can, I can see the value uh, and I can also see how it, it created winners and losers. It's very opposed to a Danish approach. Denmark, mm-hmm. there's a massive focus on equality, right? Uh, that, that's like the, 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 the value above all values uh, here. Um, and, and so anything that in any way can look like, you know, oppression of the smaller and the weaker is immediately shut down. Uh, and I can see that that's a good thing in some ways, but I can also see something that's been lost. And, and when you talk about initiation, so we work together quite a bit in my work with a guy called Arne Rubenstein, uh, who has uh, a business called The Making of Men. He's written a book as well. Have a chair, right chair. Um, and, and he works with, it's basically rites of passage. He's studied rites of passage rituals from around the world and then put together a training program in, in how to initiate young boys. And he's initiated hundreds of thousands of young boys in Australia, actually, mm-hmm. uh, and been quite inspiring. So we've had him up here and did some training courses with him as well. Very cool. Yeah, just talk with uh, Joel Davis. You know him? He's got a YouTube channel. He's from yeah. Australia. Mm-hmm. Had a good talk with him on my last uh, uh, Rooster's Crow episode. And it's interesting hearing his, he's kind of a little bit younger than us, but I, I you know, interesting hearing the similarities and dissimilarities of him growing up kind of at, at, in Australia and Melbourne at that time as well. Um, now, I know that in South, uh, South Africa, there's been this kind of, they kind of, in, the strain of social justice 
was really early on in kind of infiltrated in South Africa. And um, is that school that you went to still there and still has that kind of ethos or have to have things changed at that school as well? To a certain extent, some things have changed, but I think that um, they have managed to hold on to some things for sure. It seems like it is a traditional, it's a very traditional town that it's situated in as well. I mean, it, you know, I don't know if it's all been functional. When I was there, then a law was passed in parliament. This is back in probably early nineties, uh, forbidding kids from getting hidings at school. Uh, saying like, you know, this law has been passed. We're going to continue to use corporal punishment on the children. If you have a problem with that, then we advise you to get your kids out of school. I'm pretty sure they're not doing that anymore. I'm quite sure that that's been shut down now and, and that's not happening. But, uh, you know, when, when we were there, then we, we had to, you know, if, if we went to even into town during the weekends, we wore school uniform. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were caught drinking alcohol uh, or smoking a cigarette, that would be a, a warning and, and two or three warnings and you get kicked out of the school. And I'm, I'm pretty mm. sure that that's, that's still present. And, and it, it means that it's a, it creates a culture where, you know, it's really only the dropouts, like the real bums who, who mm -hmm. fall into that. Uh, and, yeah. and here in the kind of like culture of tolerance in Denmark, it's the drinking culture starts from 15 years old and it's glorified. Like you're a real, you're, you're a real loser if you don't drink and smoke with the rest of your class. And, and that's, a, I have a 14 year old son and that's, that's a challenge that, you know, he, he, he hasn't got into that at all yet, but it's, it's going to take some willpower for him to, to stay out of it. I'm sure. Yeah. That's uh, in America too. I mean, it's very heavily in your, our initiation is massive amounts of alcohol consumption especially in the college days. Uh, it's kind of just a given. And we're talking about massive amounts continuously of, of, uh, of alcohol consumption. It's an interesting kind of thing that that's, that's, the, uh, that's kind of the way it, it kind of go about it. It's kind of strange because we, we set up young adults with uh, a lot of times, you know, alcohol addiction, a lot of times functional, but at the same time, you're, you're, you're starting off in a kind of a tough spot. Um, so what brought you to Denmark from South Africa? Yeah, I, I, I left South Africa when I was 18, uh, moved to London, uh, planning to earn my fortune or something like that, but ended up uh, having problems with my visa. Mm -hmm. uh, and long story short, I somehow ended up in Egypt, of all places, mm. uh, and met uh, a Danish woman in Egypt. Okay. And, uh, married, married her after, yeah, she came to South Africa, was there for a year. Uh, and then we, we married and I moved up here. Very cool. How long have you been married? So my first marriage lasted seven years, mm -hmm. uh, did not last. We have one child from that marriage. Um, uh, I adopted a very Danish mindset and found that that wasn't very, uh, yeah, very uh, strong for creating a long lasting marriage, <laughs> the Danish mm -hmm. approach to uh, relationships and, and married life. Uh, so so was single for quite some years um, and now just a year and a half ago, uh, remarried again uh, and have a, actually it's not even a year and a half ago. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, yeah, about a year and a half ago. Yeah, remarried and, and have a have a seven month old baby uh, with my wow. with my new wife now as well. Yeah. Awesome, congratulations, man. Uh, both boys, 14 year old boy and a seven month old boy. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. both boys, yeah. Yeah, and Noah have, and uh, Emmanuel. Nice, yeah, I have a uh, six year old boy, a going on three-year-old girl and a one-year-old boy, Elijah. Um, Congratulations. So we, thank you. So you both, we both brought a, <laughs> we both brought a, a human into the world during the, uh, the, the pandemic. So these are pandemic yeah. babies in a sense. Yeah, so, pandemic babies. He's almost never met any other people, right? <laughs> Just yeah. like every time a new person, like, wow, a new person. <laughs> yep. Yeah. We were in the hospital, like right in the midst of uh, the COVID and everything. And, you know, it was, it was, it was uh, stressful at that time, but that, that child has been a blessing like no other. I mean, his just demeanor, it's just from day one, he slept, you dropped him in the bed. He's like a, just sleeps quietly for nine hours, like almost from the get go, just completely happy go lucky. He was a little bit of grace from God, giving us some, you know, some peace in the time of trouble, you know? Fantastic. Um, so what is the, uh, what's it like? And I guess it'd be a question for your 14 year old, like, or just what is your perspective on the, the way that the schooling uh, instantiates itself in Denmark versus maybe South Africa? Kind of what are the kind of the way that school goes about 
like you were talking yeah. about about the uh, well, the biggest difference is is Denmark uh, has the highest work face female workforce participation rates in the world. Uh, there are more females working here than anywhere else. Uh, it's really frowned upon if you're a woman in Denmark and you want to stay at home. That that's seen as like something's wrong with you. Right? There's like it's weird, right? Like my wife is not planning to go back to work, and, and she has to. She regularly gets like people who are very confused with that and not understanding why a, a intelligent strong uh independent woman would want to not get have her own career um but so but but child care has been you know kind of delegated to the state uh, it's mm. all mainly state schooling um there are private schools they're quite expensive um so the vast majority go to what's called uh public schools or folk school um and and the, the school tries to not only you know they, they they have the role of not just teaching the children but also raising the children and, and mm -hmm. teaching them values because the parents are often too busy to do that uh, and so it's a constant political battle about you know which values should be imparted to the children but there is certainly a what you would what i would call a um an overweight of feminine values and and that's very clear in seeing how Danish boys struggle much, much more than Danish girls do with, you know, I think so there's, there's nine boys diagnosed with attention deficit disorder for every one girl in Denmark. Um, mm. And boys are struggling big time in the entire education system, especially in universities. And if you, if you look at some educations, like, you know, public health and uh, psychology and stuff like that, it's, it's up to like 90, over 90% women. Um, mm. Uh, in, in many educations, law, medicine uh, are all, you know, very much being taken over by women these days at, at the universities. Um, technology, engineering are still male dominated, um, mm -hmm. but but on average, uh, men are are there's far less men in universities than we we even even for priests we now have uh, uh, I think since 2007 or so there's been a majority of female priests in Denmark as well. Mm. Yeah, I heard uh, there's a saying that, you know, uh, boys or men are generally more interested in things and then women are more generally more interested in people. So that's why, you know, the you know, women go into a lot of times nursing and school, men go into, you know, uh, engineering and technology and whatnot. There's mm -hmm. also this saying that I think Peterson was saying that, you know, in the most egalitarian nations such as Denmark, Sweden, the um, the the roles of the masculine and feminine kind of get distributed back into their traditional roles. Is that true? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, to, to a certain, at least if you look at career choice, I think that's what he's been referring to. Yeah. So yeah, there's, there's a even stronger tendencies in Denmark and Sweden. I work a lot with Swedes as well. And in, in among Swedes, there's also a stronger tendency to, for people to choose gender typical careers than you know other you know iran or india or spain or something like that's far far more polarized in, in scandinavian countries which i would say have you know very directly and very uh um, efficiently kind of gotten to long distances to make gender equality and even equal distribution of gender you know the intention and the the the, the letter of the law you know sweden even has a, a feminist political party you know they have a political mm -hmm. party, the feminist party um who've been sitting in parliament and mm -hmm, yeah had quite a bit of influence so what are feminine values <sighs> yeah um feminine values as opposed to masculine values would be well you said that uh just in context of you said that you know feminine values have, are championed in, in denmark so much so what the, the boys are suffering and whatnot what what does that look like in that context yeah, so it's it's a higher focus on equality, on compassion, uh, lower focus on on achievement, on <laughs> justice, uh, and on you know there's there's like a balance between this you know truth and justice kind of thing, right? Uh, or sorry, compassion and, and truth and justice, and and so it's uh, it's more the the feminine or the more the left hand values and the masculine or the more right hand. I would say, yeah, sounds good, right? You know, it sounds good on, on, uh, we want a society that has more compassion, more empathy, more justice, more equality, mm -hmm. wonderful things, right. And in, in themselves. Um, so mm -hmm. what's the, and I was on the, you know, the left for most of my life and I'm now politically homeless. Um, and I was actually appreciated the, the initial first wave feminist movement. And I still think that, you know, if we build a society where you know, women and men have the 
equal opportunities to choose what they want to do for a living is wonderful. And that you can have women be great, better leaders, better at whatever, you know, whatever the specific circumstance is. But as a general rule, there seems to be some sort of, you know, kind of hidden negative effect that that happens that looks like it's presented in a, in a positive way, but there's something, some issue there. And, and I think in, in this instance, like I was going to ask you who raises, who's consi- who's supposed to raise the kids, right? And you said the state does it, right? So there's this kind of anti-family value structure um, that I just find uh, allergic, I'm like kind of allergic to that. And I see it continue to be um, expressed, especially in the United States now that the nuclear family is in itself problematic. Not that there are problems within nuclear families that the structure of, you know, father, wife, and, and the kids is, is in itself problematic. And there needs to be this kind of uh, collective cold, so state run child rearing. Um, but mm-hmm. what's your experience been with that? Yeah, I was just having a conversation over lunch today with two people actually um, about how I meet so many young men today who've never in any way heard about or been inspired with anything good about marriage and having a family. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's a surprise to many of them. Um, JP Marceau wrote an article on our blog uh, about uh, some aspects of married life and how fantastic it is and how beautiful it is and especially the cosmic significance mm-hmm. of participating in a married marriage relationship and channeling one's sexual energy into a married relationship. So how, how doing that enables one to participate in a kind of a, a deeper communion between two people and, and how that spills out into a kind of the community level and out into a state level as the building block, you know, the family is the building block of a state and up into a cosmic level as well. And we've just had people commenting on like, I've, I think the, the direct comment that I, I read yesterday was, I've never ever behaved in any way responsibility with my sexuality in my entire life. And I've just realized that from realizing this article, how much I've been misusing and my sexuality and so that's the most scary thing is that nowhere in our culture in our society are, are people getting this information and it's it's pretty basic stuff and the problem is that we've just taken it for granted for such a long time and then maybe as men we've been guilty of you know in locker rooms and after football games and frustrated and whatever and then talking negatively about our wives and about our our our, our own frustrations in life and stuff like that and and so that's that's just there hasn't been this transfer of information about how valuable and powerful it is being in a relationship like that. And so that somehow, and, and to tell you the truth for many, you know, so I, I as I mentioned earlier, I got married uh, when I was quite young, when I was, when I was 20 uh, and that marriage, the, all of the structures and systems I understood for why that marriage, uh, you know, that I was building it on were, were faulty, <laughs> But I never knew any other way to do it. And so the marriage faltered and failed and, and died. Um, and, and after that, it was just like, well, I'm never going to get married again. Are you crazy? Like that, that doesn't work. It's a broken system. It, maybe it worked for like my grandparents, but it's not going to work anymore today. So, and, and I then thought like, oh, the problem was me. <laughs> that was the problem, right? The problem was my, under, my lack of understanding of how to create. It was all about me trying to get something for myself, right? And, and not... Um, not realizing, no, actually, the process here is is to break yourself to create something far more beautiful uh, together with another person, uh, yeah. and and get out of that trap of just like you know atomized, selfish me building myself more and more into my closed little universe of looking for satisfying my own needs, right? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, well put, and I think it's uh, there's something that is very beautiful and profound about marriage right? It is, you know, you literally like talking from a symbolic perspective, you become a body of one, right? Under Christ, right? You up-level your kind of ontology, right? And then the ideas of sacrifice, right? The man is to sacrifice part of your identity, who you are, right? To the woman and to the family. And the woman submits to the man. And this idea of, oh, why would a woman submit? It's, it, they, you know, it should be done if it's done in an appropriate manner. It's done willfully and beautifully with love and responsibility, but it's a reciprocal relationship. So to the extent that the woman is sub- to submit to her husband, 
the husband is to sacrifice care and protect and provide for the woman in the family. So it's this like proper hierarchy as such. And if that's done at the familial level, and then it's done, at, it, it can ripple out at the corporate levels. Like, you, like I'm a, a, I'm in a leadership role in the work that I do. And uh, you've had bosses, you know, that are jerks, right? They're in it for themselves. And I think this is most of the case, mostly the case, at least in the United States, uh, that the uh, incentive structures orient leaders to be really kind of selfish. And, you know, in this term of this term of service, uh, servant leadership is used a lot, but it's rarely executed like that. But I think mm -hmm. you, we can use this idea of the, the, pro the appropriate relationship between the masculine and feminine that can be done at the familial level. If that can be done at the corporate level and then the political level, right? Um, I think that is a, a key to kind of mm -hmm. at least, you know, ostensibly bring in the kingdom uh, in, on, on earth as it is in heaven. But these ideas have been so anathemized that it's hard to even have a conversation with someone that, you know, hasn't considered these ideas in a sense. It's so difficult to explain it. And and also to just, you know, like, it's so easy to get caught up in an idea, well, oh, well, well, what will people think about like, oh, then men are always going to be leaders for women and women can't be leaders. And that does look, it's like the way that that's not at all any, in any way derogatory towards women. Actually, it's it's derogatory to, you know, our whole culture doesn't understand feminine values so much. And, and mm -hmm. you know, they're hard to explain in the same way, you know, but like the, the, the you know, the, the holding function that the woman does just this Friday, we were, we were a group of people watching a, a scene from Beauty and the Beast, actually, the cartoon version of it. Mm -hmm. and, and the way that Beauty, even with her, like, slightly, you know, the way that she does it, um, kind of like civilizing Beast and then in some way transforming him from the evil monster. There's one moment where she says to him, like, after, after he's just saved her life from the wolves, and he says, like, thank you for saving my life. And then he says, you're welcome. And he's, he's transformed from this, like, raging animal to the gentleman that's holding and you know all the other the rest of the family draw nearer and you know suddenly he he's he's turned into you know that that's what the woman can do she sets the scene she create she's the garden where the tree can grow kind of thing right and mm -hmm. so it, and and there's there's something beautiful and amazing about that and you it's a mystery exactly how it works i guess but but it's an you know for me like the later waves of feminism, the feminism we're seeing today, it, it actually hates femininity. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's driven by people who hate femininity. And, and, they, and the only thing they see is power. It's, everything is seen through this analysis of masculine, dominant, tyrannical power to decide over other people. And it's, it's, a, it's like, you know, turning everything into the tyrannical, <laughs> controlling masculine. Um, and the ironies is that, is that there, you know, there's this idea of toxic masculinity, right? And instead of, uh, you know, instead of appreciating femininity, because it, it's absolutely necessary and, and equally important as masculinity, right? This whole idea of femininity has been appropriated by toxic masculinity. It's like, you know, there's these tyrants that go for power, you know, masculine that um, obtain power for the sake of power. We need to tear them down, but they replace them. It's like, you know, they're not looking to end oppression. They're looking to reverse it in a sense where it's like, and it's like, uh, it's obvious. And I'm like, am I biased in seeing that that's happening? Uh, like what we're seeing like is, is we've been, the incentive structures and the way that we orient ourselves to the world is so, you know, dis, disintegrating, has a dis, disintegrating effect. Like women should be able to be CEOs. I agree. Women should be able to work 80 hours and overwork themselves and overstress themselves and, and disregard their family like, like a lot of men do. Okay, I agree. That should be a good thing if a woman wants to do it. But to develop and structure society where that is the, the, the champion cause, it's like, well, who's going to take care of the kids? Well, you know, like, is it a man supposed to do that? And there, there probably are great men that I'm very oriented towards. I love, you know, child rearing and whatnot, but who's supposed to take care of, of the children in a sense? And it's like, you ask that question, oh, you think the woman's place is in the home? Uh, yes, not all women, but it's a wonderful, it's the most important thing. It's the most important job is the caregiver at home for the children what's more important than that yeah and i i meet so many women who 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 really want to do that but feel the pressure you know from, we we indoctrinate them from very very young that they shouldn't be doing that right like all of the heroes that are you know it is all amelia earhart and uh mm -hmm. like the, the great you know the the wild and wonderful that we, we were actually given my son was given a book uh 
strangely enough, with like stories and the title was called uh, Rebellious Girls and Heroes or something like that. And it was all about like the most rebellious and powerful and strong girl stories from, from modern culture. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting how, how blind that, that we've, we've come to that and, and how, how great it is to be at home sometimes. And, and, you know, and, and I think there's far more women that want to do that than, mm-hmm. than, than is seen or realized. And, and, and here in Denmark and in the UK, I think that's increasingly being realized by, by more and more people. It's very aggressively sidelined by the mainstream media, but it's coming out all kinds of other places as well. Um, so yeah, we'll yeah. see what happens. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, you know, I think it's a consequence of this idea that Peterson mentions of, you know, egalitarian nations, you know, the, the man and the woman's role becomes more pronounced. And I think that's happening uh, in the workplace, but I think it's trickling down maybe to the family as well, which is kind of a reorientation towards, towards family, which I think is, is paramount in kind of terms of what's coming here um, or what's here. Uh, what do you, what do you do for work? If you don't mind me asking. This is my full-time gig as a manifesto. Uh, So we've been running what's called the European Men's Gathering for the last four four and a half years, um, where we gather 140 guys. uh, We've from normally 30, 35 countries, they, they come. We've had people come from Canada, US. Uh, Jonathan Peugeot is planning to come uh, this summer. Uh, so we'll wow. see how it goes with Corona and entry, but he's, he's gonna come as one of our speakers. Um, and it's a, it's a big group of people who are engaged in this work basically. And we take them far off into the countryside and give a real deep dive experience uh, of exploring together, what does it mean to be a man? Uh, mm. And then other than that, we also do online men's groups, which is especially taken off here during corona uh where we we have like a network of men's groups where we're yeah working together towards uh basically supporting each other and reaching the goals that we're setting for for ourselves wonderful yeah i'm going to link to it in the description here to your website and to that group so how did you find yourself getting into this space four years ago yeah well it's i started getting in probably more like six and a half seven years ago Mm -hmm. um I'll, I'll give the, a slight continuation. I told a little bit of my life story uh, up until I moved to Denmark, right? And so mm-hmm. um, my, and, and then I, I married and then divorced. And so basically what I was facing is that I, I had taken a, a master's education. I then got a job. I worked for Microsoft for eight years. I had a very successful career with them. Um, had like the great elevator pitch and felt like I'd achieved all the goals I thought that would make me happy but wasn't very happy and, and mm-hmm. lost contact with my wife uh, and, and, and we divorced. And so it was kind of like suddenly my, you know, I was standing there and everything that I thought about my way forward in the world just showed up to not be working. And I had, I'd grown up as a Christian, but had quickly coming to Denmark turned, had considered myself an atheist. Uh, so kind of for Explicitly, some time, like yeah, yeah. I was like the, I was even like the kind of Sam Harris, you know, like I'd go around and find people who were religious and tell them why they were wrong and like kind of, you know, deliberate, like destroy their arguments or whatever. Like Christopher uh, Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, the whole four horsemen, you know, kind of yeah. atheist uh, explosion. Yeah. yeah so so uh, you and real quick, were your parents were Protestant or yeah, 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 yeah okay. kind of old school Pentecostal. Uh, yeah, my, my grandfather actually founded a, a whole church in South Africa wow. that kind of. Um, had about yeah five thousand people in it or something like that for for a wow. while. So country. you fell away from that. How old were you when you fell away from that and started uh, you know looking and, and expressing you know your atheism? Twenty one, twenty two, like the first year and a half or so that I moved to Denmark and started getting involved in society here. Just mm-hmm. um, yeah, yeah. I, uh, so yeah, did I, that, God I, not I, exist for you then, or was he a, a fairy tale, a story that people make up to avoid their fear of death what were your thoughts there 21 year old paul my thoughts was that god didn't exist uh nothing of this makes sense it's all just strange little fairy tales to keep you people comfortable yeah it was like silly silly old stories that weren't relevant for modern enlightened human beings who who understood the way things really worked and evolution uh was kind of like ample evidence for why that was all ridiculous but religion was also the cause of all the wars and um, all the conflicts that had ever happened in society, basically. You know, religion was that which was separated people. It was a very, very poor analysis, very, very superficial analysis, but I was utterly convinced of it. And I 
get quite aggressive with people who didn't agree with me. And so kind of, you know, just with yeah. sheer power of argument could destroy other people, will make them feel very bad about what they thought about religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What were your political leanings at that time? Did they match? So, yeah, yeah. So I be actually became, that's why I got really interested in politics at that time then as well. So I, instead of that, uh, so um, I, I signed up for a party in Denmark. The direct translation of the name is the radical left, but they're actually, they're, what they would actually be called as the social liberal party. Um, and they're a centrist party in Danish politics. Uh, so they have very uh, liberal cultural immigration and kind of um, values policies. And then financially, they're very, um, they're very conservative. Uh, yeah. Although in Denmark, we, we would use the word liberal for conservative, actually. So liberal actually means free markets. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a yeah. mix switched on the whole American understanding. Yeah. So, so what was that what was your stance on uh and what is the guys I guess the general stance on immigration um from you know at at that time what was your understanding of it? Um I remember having some thoughts about quite a, quite like some being torn inside about it. Um the parties approach to immigration was like basically as much as possible as free and as open as possible. Uh, so we should just like share all the good stuff that we have with all of those poor hungry Africans out there or whatever. And it fitted well with me being an immigrant myself. But I remember listening to several politicians from the right and really understanding what they were saying, but never admitting that because they were, they, they're generally seen as yeah, evil and bad. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're like, you know, they're, they're just evil basically. And, and so, especially my wife, at that time, she would be very upset with me if I ever expressed any kind of sympathy for right-leaning immigration policies. Even though it, it intuitively made sense to me, I, I decided to take the right opinion, which was um, in accordance with the party that I was in. Yeah. 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 So that's around 21 years old. Um, take me how, when did you start questioning that and start having these uh, kind of ideas of, um, you know, looking at other ideas or other values that, uh, you weren't kind of barred from doing. What did that look like? Yeah. Well, I mean, so my my relationship with my ex-wife ended. Um, I uh, started doing a lot of rock climbing, mm -hmm. uh, and that took me all around the world, traveling out in beautiful, amazing nature. Uh, and I remember having a conversation with a friend where I told him, like, you know, like being up on that wall, you know, two hundred meters above the ground, uh, with just mountains around me and no other people, and that's like my church. And and mm -hmm. so I had like a just reconnected to myself after like eight years of corporate life and rat race and striving uh, for big city cosmopolitan culture, I guess. Uh, spent three months like living out in different beautiful natural spaces, but then started doing yoga as injury prevention training for my cl rock climbing. Uh, yoga led to different types of new age spirituality. Different types of new age spirituality led me to a festival called Burning Man. Uh, I actually became, I went to Burning Man in the US and then I started going, we started organizing Burning Man festivals in Denmark. I actually mm -hmm. became the regional contact for Burning Man in Denmark. That's why I was wow. very involved in that community. Uh, I had a group of friends who got into Tantra. And so I got into involved in Tantra as well uh, and all kinds of weird and wonderful um, different things. Uh, and somewhere along that way, Jesus Christ started popping up occasionally. <laughs> and I was first like quite confused. I, the first time was I, I was in Thailand at this like tantric yoga school and there was a Swami who was this very authoritative fi figure. And then he gave this like lecture on Jesus Christ on Easter. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, oh, that's weird. Like I, I wasn't expecting, because I, I was basically looking for any kind of spirituality except for Christianity. Because Christianity yep. was like just, just the last thing that I would possibly be interested in, but everything else was interesting, right? And I, I kind of had an ironic distance to everything that I was doing as well. Like I, I didn't really go in for it. I was still like this hard, cold, agnostic, atheistic kind of type mm -hmm. anyway. But I, I went into the experiences, lots of beautiful women, lots of like fun hedonistic things to experience as well and stuff. Um, but then, yeah, slowly but surely, Jesus Christ started showing up in different places. And then, and then I'd say I, it's probably Jordan Peterson, my first experiences of him, that, that was really like... Um, he at one stage he said he said he, he had a bible and it was like this book here you know like some of the stories in it are, are you know more than two thousand years old or more than ten thousand years old like 
you at least have to contend with it. You can't just write it off as fairy tales. It's, you have to take it seriously. And that was just like, yeah, he's, he's right. He's absolutely mm -hmm. right. Like I've, I've just written something off that's actually far, far deeper and more meaningful. Yeah. Uh, and so, and, and, and so that, that opened up that doorway to me. Um, and yeah, then a whole lot of stuff happened which really just was a deepening and, and, and a nuancing of everything that I'd experienced up to that point in my life. Um, but suddenly I had a direction to it, mm -hmm. uh, whereas before there was no direction. And so that was just uh, really um, a, a confirmation of everything that was good and right in my life and an explanation of all the things that had been going off track because suddenly yeah. everything fitted into place. Like before, nothing, I, before it was like that the main experience was just like, I, I had to work so hard to make everything fit and make sense and figure out what was the most important stuff. And then all of a sudden I was like, ah, like breathing a sigh of relief, like everything makes sense now, everything fits in. I don't have to figure it out anymore. It's now it's just a, a question of surrendering to something that's far bigger, right? Than, than yeah, because you can't get, if you try to get rid of God or religion, right? All of a sudden you are the one who has to figure everything out. You are the one that is the ultimate arbiter of truth, uh, which sounds good again from a you know left from just a general perspective. You know, Nietzsche says creature and values in a sense. That was his idea to the death of God. Uh, yeah, but uh, experientially, that's not how it works out, and it could literally destroy you in a sense and your relationships. Uh, and it's interesting that this uh, you know uh, surrendering, finally getting building a relationship with. Uh, with Christ, which sounds crazy to me, even say it now, like five, five years ago, me looking at me, we'd be like, dude, what happened? Did you fall into a cult? <laughs> like, what are you doing? Like, you know, so uh, very interesting resonances there. Um, so did you start reading the scripture at a particular age again? Or how, how did that come about in terms of the Bible? Yeah, in, in small doses, I think more like, listen, you know, today when I listen to Jordan Peterson talking about the Bible, I'm like, oh my gosh, the guy is like a machine gun just shooting off in different directions. It's very, very confusing. But, but, but more it was that kind of thing. And I think that kind of like opened up small little things for me. Through all of this time, uh, I've been having conversations with my dad. Uh, and my dad's been praying for me all of this time, a lot, and my mom, I'm sure. But uh, mm -hmm. but the conversation with my dad, we've had long, we've gone through walks in the mountains. We've driven like 4,000 kilometer road trips through South Africa. Uh, so we've had long conversations all of this time. Um, uh, but, but then I think one thing that really hit me was then I was visiting South Africa uh, one day and I decided, okay, now I'm going to sit down and read what the Bible has to say about relationships and sexuality. Mm -hmm. I, I looked up all the verses that I could find on, on like sex and relationships. Um, and I think that had been a big issue for me. That had been a very, very big sticking point. Uh, and, and so I said, okay, well, I'm going to try to read this. And, and instead of looking for what reasons why it's wrong, I'm going to see what kind of wisdom because I possibly find in this 2000 year old document instead of trying to find all the faults in it and the mistakes in it. So looking for wisdom. And, and as I did that, it was like the voice of God speaking to me, or, you know, it was the voice of God speaking to me. Like it was just such a, it was a direct revelation of truth. It was just like an unfolding and uh, it was illumination of ev my entire life and everything that had been done and why everything fitted together the way it did, um, yeah. where it was just so obvious, you know, it was just so obvious that, you know, it was, it was an experience of like having being born at home and growing up at home and then leaving like a prodigal son, right. And going out mm -hmm. and having all of the experiences that I could possibly want and, and being very protected all that time as well. But then realizing I've, I've really just started eating pig's food and I'm, I'm mm -hmm. really down in, in, in the trough and it, and, and it's quite disgusting actually what I've reduced myself to. I've, I've been in polyamorous tantric communities living in, in these communities for years. And it's just like, you know, the reality of it is not the, the, the the poster the advertising of it at all i can tell you that and yeah. so and so you know um and and so then then and then realizing like okay well you know the the, the truth is right here <laughs> and, and i can just um come back to it and so that was just um yeah a good experience yeah that was it, yeah. Was, just, it was just like it just changed everything in, instantly instantly so mm -hmm. i was living with my girlfriend at that time uh we were living together and and uh, 
and she's my wife today, <laughs> spoiler alert. Um, but I, I said to her like, Hey, we, we need to be celibate for a while to figure out what the hell we want to do with ourselves. Cause we're, you know, we don't, we don't actually have a plan for what the hell we're doing and we're getting quite old here. Right. Like we're approaching our forties and we don't really know what we're aiming towards. And, and, and so I said, and she had a bit of resistance to that at the beginning. And then I said, okay, well, come read these verses here and, and try and understand this with me. And she did that. And she had the exact same experience. Like, you're right. We need to try be celibate and figure out what we want to do. And so then we tried to like, we continued living together for a while while we're celibates. And that was just like, suddenly we realized like, oh, now we actually have to start loving each other instead of just like, mm -hmm. being able to have like makeup sex every time we like do stupid, hateful things towards each other. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, but, but, but then I realized like, well, I really need to go deeper with this. So I actually then moved out six months, lived in a, another apartment in Copenhagen but then decided to move out into the countryside by myself for nine months. I mm. uh, went, to, went to live in a Danish high school, which is like a kind of a, an adult boarding school kind of thing, um, studied, focused on leadership and theology, um, and spent nine months there, really like just going on long walks in the countryside by myself and trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Broke up with, with, uh, with my, my partner then. Uh, and at some point during that stay, I realized, well, yeah, well, several things happened. One thing is that I, I had a real big trouble finding any kind of Christian church that I actually wanted to be a part of. I found like all the Christian churches that I visited. I didn't trust the men, actually, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. I didn't trust the men. I didn't really, I couldn't feel them. Uh, and then I walked into an Orthodox church uh, one December Saturday evening, <laughs> shortly before Christmas, um, and was just like stepped into uh a place with just something, something very, very beautiful and, and valuable, uh, and which I think can only be experienced, um, but knew like, okay, now I found it. And, mm -hmm. and then, and, and, and Laura came also, and, and she had the exact same experience. Wow. Um, and so, and so sometime after that, then I, I came back to Copenhagen, I proposed to her, uh, and, um, she said yes. And then, um, yeah, on on our wedding night, she fell pregnant with our son. Wow. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Yeah, so exactly nine months after we married, then she gave birth to our son. What a beautiful story, man! God, it's mm. inspiring to hear these things. And uh, there's this idea Jonathan Peugeot talks about it a lot, and it's like the stories in the Bible, they make up the fabric of life. They're not just stories; they are they like. And I just saw the prodigal son in your story, right, uh, wandering the desert trying to, you know, kind of wrestle with God. Uh, you had a revelation through new eyes, uh, looking for the promised land, your sacrifice and chastity led you to the kind of unite with your wife here and, and propose to her when you got, uh, you, when you sorted yourself out in a sense, it's like, these are uh, fundamental structures of being. They're not just old stories. And it's so amazing to realize that. Um, so that's a, it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. Uh, question, what is your dad, um, think about Jordan Peterson, these ideas or your kind of orthodoxy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, he's, he, he, so he, he's not a massive fan, I would say. Um, my father grew up Catholic. Uh, I think from the stories he tells, it sounds like it was a pretty bad Catholic church that he grew up in. I don't want to, I don't know anything about it, but it, it sounds like he had a bad, pretty bad experience there. And so he rejected the Catholic church and turned to a kind of a, 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 a Protestant church. And so he has a hard time. He's when he comes to an Orthodox church. So before I joined the Catholic church, I invited my dad to come to Denmark and I asked him to come and participate in meetings and i also asked him to spend quite a bit of time together with my then to, my fiance at that time because i wanted to get his approval uh or his kind of his advice uh before i got married the second time because i one of these things i've realized the value of the father and the father's mm -hmm. input so he he loved the idea of me getting married to laura he was not such a fan of of the church um and uh I'd say he he finds that it, Jordan Peterson is like an overcomplication of uh, of some very simple truths in some ways, and and so he I, I would he probably would I don't think it'd be unfair to call him a little bit kind of he's not a big fan of like a kind of academic intellectual approach whatsoever. I remember growing up he would always say like no theology is the art of making simple things difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so for him it's a very it's a far more simple and direct approach, um, and. 
in some ways I can, I can really honor and value that, that, that he has that. And I can see the, the purity of that kind of almost like childlike understanding, you know, not in, mm-hmm. a, not in a negative way, but in a very positive way of that childlike understanding. And then I just know, like, I can't, or I wish I could go back to that in some ways, but I, I need to complicate everything and make everything far more, you know, it needs to go through a lot more filters. And right. maybe the, the, the load, the burden I carry with me from, you know, a life lived out outside of the city gates. Yeah, wonderful. How, how was uh, this kind of uh, new orthodox you found? How does that change your perspective or your being as a father yourself? Mm. Well, it, <laughs> it, it makes me see how fatherhood is one of the most fundamental basic patterns of existence that repeats itself everywhere and done well, everything comes into alignment and done badly it, it, it it's a it's a it's a cause of the deepest pain and misery and 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 it's, it's basically a direct way into the pit uh, and i can only especially now so my son is 14 years old and <laughs> i can also see the value of sonship uh, because in in some ways and i've told my son this is that he's he's been um a massively important anchor in my life that's because he's it's there's a truth to that, to to a young child that is one's son, and there's a seeing of things the way they are, and somehow, and and so that's that's really uh, I, that that interplay. I've suddenly become so much more aware of it, mm-hmm. um, where before I don't think I I saw it clearly. So it's the biggest honor, and 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 you know I've told my I've told my wife now like you know I want us to have three kids um, if we can get it in, uh, and it's just the most amazing thing to spend time with my my little baby Emmanuel and 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 to know like you know I'm not with him every day and all day at all uh and I, I'm off most of the time I'm off doing the stuff I need to do to provide and protect and mm-hmm. and, and and look after him but it, it, it's just such a privilege to to be able to do that yeah uh, and and it's and it's beautiful and I feel so confirmed in it in so many ways uh, yeah. and how yeah yeah, wonderful. I had a similar experience. I think uh, having that son into your life or bringing a child into this world and uh, the love that you have for that child can give you an insight into the love that God has for humanity, right? But like just up level that, that's like a lower dimensional slice of a very profound thing that we can't understand, uh, but kind of just, uh, it's unfathomable, but it's the most beautiful, wonderful thing that, that uh, I've ever experienced myself. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think something something for me was also like just as you get older, you realize how everything in life disappears and falls away, and then you see that bond of fatherhood and sonship and motherhood, and, you know, and mm-hmm. like whatever. Right? The, just those bonds are just how powerful they are and how deeply they influence us and how 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 much they they give again when you really nourish them and how poisonous it is to neglect them. You know, how yeah. it's like it's it's neglecting a part of yourself. Mm-hmm. I have a good friend who, do, who does a lot of system constellation therapy and, and, you know, it, I don't understand it completely, but wow, this, the, he just, they have just had these simple, simple systems of, of how structures, family structures work. And, and it just puts words so directly on, on issues that we all have and that are the same everywhere in human existence somehow. Right. And, and mm-hmm. I find that really, really fascinating and amazing. And, and it's beyond, I, I don't think we can explain it with science, but yeah. when we step out of the scientific mindset and, and this family constellation stuff, it is a little weird and strange and transcendental somehow, right? But it just points directly at some fundamental structures in human existence um, that are very meaningful and powerful. Yeah. So it's called family constellation. Is that what you said? Yeah. How, how, how yeah. would we find that if we wanted to check that out as well? Um, well, I actually understand Jonathan Peugeot's dad is into it as well. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> That's yeah. what I, yeah, I've been told that by Jonathan. So I'm pretty sure it's correct. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 we, I can probably find the, the link of the, the guy. It's, it's a, the guy, who, but so his dad found some Catholic uh, guy who created a system and then, um, yeah. Yeah. And I can find my friend, his name is Ola Biao. He's offering this work in Copenhagen as well. Uh, he's also written a book about the meaning of being a man from a mm-hmm. Heideggerian perspective. Um, and, and he's also working with that family constellation therapy. Okay. Um, so it's, it's kind of like a therapeutic approach, but a very simple structured 
approach, which in some ways I think fits men better than the current therapy industry, I think has kind of gone off the rails a little bit for at yeah. least many men. Uh, and, and so I, I kind of see the work we're doing as well as disrupting the, the therapy industry. Basically, we're just teaching men how to create good and productive friendships again mm -hmm. because that's what you know a lot of people are just pay a therapist to like sit and be their friend by listening and listening to their problems but their problems yeah. they don't they don't lead them anywhere right and so they get stuck so yeah. yeah i find that uh you know the orthodox i have this book that i've written I've, I've read some on my channel and the book uh orthodox uh beauty will save the world the ethics of beauty and it talks mm -hmm. about the relationship between a a sinner and, and an actual spiritual father a confessor and how this is kind of the thought of psychoanalysis is a bastardization of this idea, right? Because in psychoanalysis, you have a credentialed, you know, psychoanalyst that is going to observe and analyze your, um, you know, through talk therapy, whatever it may be, and then prescribe based on his schooling and background, either cognitive behavioral ther therapy or psychopharmacotic, um, or, you know, pharmacy, uh, medication, whatever it may be, right? So it's like, if you go and, and you're confessing though, when you're going to talk therapy, you're talking through things uh, that have happened in your past traumas and whatnot. Right. And the thing that heals that in, in terms of the Orthodox perspective is the love of God. So if you go to a confessor and you confess your sins, that priest, that spiritual father is not judging you is not looking at you as a, an analyst is looking at you as a fellow sinner. Right. And in that mystery that happens there, you're healed through confessing your sins. And it's a, such a beautiful, deep, rich experience and, and thing to consider that it just puts to shame kind of our, our secular psychoanalytic, you know, therapies that we have out there. Um, if you can like, find trust in your heart to uh, the idea of a spiritual father, I think that's our biggest fear is like, do we really trust? So that the, the whole, but the, the thing is, I think, you know, the, the psychoanalyst, he has just as much power. It's just hidden behind the mask of accreditations and university <laughs> examinations and stuff like that. Like I studied psychotherapy. I did a course in psychotherapy and I very quickly decided I'm not going to be a psychotherapist. And mm -hmm. I, think, I think part of that is just realizing like how much power you wield as a psychotherapist. Like you're, you're, you know, you're tinkering around in people's minds and, and unfortunately there's not, it's not a very good incentive structure that's set up there. It's, it's a, because it's a business relationship, you know, mm -hmm. your, your primary interest is to be driving your business. And so it's, it's, yeah. It's kind of scary and, and it's scary as well. And it's been misused in all kinds of, you know, religious settings as well. Um, and, and that's just one of our biggest lacks. You know, we, we're, we lack fathers, we lack father figures, role models, and we really lack spiritual fatherhoods. I mean, while you know, in Denmark, that, that such a thing has not existed for a long time. Yeah, I think they're few and far between even actual, you know, uh, real confessors. Uh, if you find one, man. It's such a beautiful thing. And this kind of came up for me here. See if it tracks a little bit. Um, so it's like the feminine is the love, the place where the truth comes into being. So what we need most now is the actual feminine to come and heal, right? A space where the love, the truth and beauty can enter into the world. Uh, so the, the thing that we need in this world is the thing that's been manipulated and turned into this, uh, you know, this power, this kind of weird strange thing and it's it's a uh, it's ironic and and that's how kind of the uh the adversary works he takes the most true thing right because the adversary can't create anything right can just manipulate it and it manipulates it um to kind of to, to bastardize it um so that's kind of kind of what came up with me uh, but here just a few minutes that we have left i guess i could talk for you for a while here i got another um another episode here or another recording to do but what is your uh we didn't get into kind of we can have another conversation your kind of political understanding is right now how orthodoxy informs that and what do you think is the relationship of uh, like a true christian spirituality towards politics mm -hmm. i think i think i can actually talk even broader than true christian but just like uh, uh, any kind of any person who's trying to take a spiritual uh, approach you know i mean and, I, and we work a lot with people who come from all kinds of spiritual directions uh, and i think if you if you really come from a place of spirit and depth then you'll realize that politics is is two groups of people or you know more than two groups of people who basically are engaged in a power battle and have fragments of the truth that they're clinging to uh, and 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 some of them will have larger fragments than others uh, and some of them are better at you know at, in some way embodying that fragment of truth as well and and there are good people in politics i'm sure of it um 
but as a political scientist, I have really withdrawn from engaging in and following politics because I, I I have a natural tendency today to to be drawn towards right wing politicians. You know that that's my that's my personality and and my limited perspective. And you know, as human beings, we have limited perspectives and we only see parts of the truth. And so, I'll naturally be drawn to right wing stuff, even though before I was far more left wing um, before I came to Christianity. Um, but but I, I, I really think it, 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 it's dangerous to identify and hold too strongly with any side in a political battle. Um, and, and, and really, what, what is politics today? It's just entertainment. It's entertainment mm -hmm. with professional entertainers who often are just buffoons and silly, incompetent entertainers and like television you know it's it's so obvious it's actors and and you know that those are the people who do well so it, it, it's because people are are looking for distraction from dealing with the real issues in their life and so instead mm -hmm. they follow in these 24-hour news channels that are entertaining us to just that we don't do what's important and so and so where does it start well it starts with me and the, what's closest to me and you know once i you know if i sorted everything that's closest you know in my own life then i can start looking at like well how can i help my wife and my kids and my parents and if i can handle handle that then i can start thinking about well how can i help my colleagues at my work and if you know i start like building up a you know very large company that i can start thinking well how can i help my local town mm -hmm. um, and 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 from there you know things can but you know, unless one has done all of those things first, then I, I think even just thinking about local politics uh, is, is, you know, it's, it's it, I, certainly for myself, it's been a, a redirection of, of my energy uh, to, you know, and so my work is very much engaged in just helping a few guys who are the closest to me to lift them up uh, and, to, and to help them uh, to be, and, and to ask them to help me as well, right? Because I need the help as much as possible as they do. Um, but but when we when we focus on just a few people lifting each other up, that's what I think can actually create the change that that we're looking for. Instead of like thinking I can solve all the problems and I understand the entire you know economic system and whatever it is. Yeah, I mean I have the almost uh, kind of exact same process that kind of went through me. I was a political scientist, really interested in political theory, and it was involved. And now I'm just thinking that well the that my thing when I left the left, I said the 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 problems and the solutions of the left are not going to be found in the right. And I still don't think that the right in itself is the right has the solution. So I'm like, I think we need to transcend politics uh, and we need to kind of uh, start, start focusing a lot on ourselves and getting our, our, our self right. And then I could have a ripple effect from self to family, to community and outwards. And so I never really considered the political aspect of it, but I was just listening to Jonathan Peugeot had Stephen D young in on uh, his channel, his last talk. He has this book here, uh, The Religion of the Apostles, which I highly recommend here, Orthodox mm -hmm. Christianity in the first century. It's really, 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 really wonderful. Um, and he says, well, eventually that that boundary, right, is going um, to brush up against politics, right? Because you have yourself, your family, and then boom, it's going to get into the political space. But I don't think it's going to be what we see, like you were saying, on the mainstream media or, you know, these entertainers that uh, hold our attention like that. I think a new politics will emerge, but it's not going to be, I don't know what it will look like, but it will not look like what we see in the corporate, the um, entertainment, the media landscape and the political landscape. It's going to be mm -hmm. other different. I don't know. And I think the leaders will, will emerge and are emerging right now that will, that will be mm -hmm. this new politics, this meta politics in a sense. Well, well, here's what we're seeing as, and we're focusing on our attention is, is the, the guys who are making the algorithms and the systems that we are perceiving the world through, you know, it, it, they are forming our reality. So it's, it's, it's the guys working in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And right now, like, you know, we're totally losing that battle big time. Right. And, but that's a big focus of my work in manifesto is to reach out to tech, tech and IT wow. guys tech and IT guys, because a lot of them are lonely, a lot of them are disconnected, a lot of them don't have don't have a strong meaning for living. And, and we're saying like, how can we be having a conversation with these guys? That's all, we just wanna have a conversation with them. We wanna be addressing the problems that they're facing in their lives and, and helping them uh, to make more sense of their life. And you know, we're not trying to like convert them to Christianity or anything like that, because Manifesto isn't a Christian organization either. But we, we have a top, we, 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 we use the term, it's quite tongue in cheek, we call it digital patriarchy. Mm. Um, and, and we're saying, well, you know, what we do have a digital patriarchy today. Um, and so what does that mean? And, and how can we 
make sure that we're creating a good one and not if it's going to be, you know, or, or, you know, do we need a digital matriarchy or, or what, right? It's like, how, how's that going to work? Um, so that's a, that's a central focus for us, uh, at least. That resonates a lot, actually. My uh, part of my channel, the focus has emerged of how can we leverage these technologies that are used to bring out the worst parts of us, right? Social media brings out the worst kind of uh, unconscious uh, demons out of us in a sense. Is there a way to, is there a way to short circuit? Is there a way to uh, reorganize the algorithms to code for the good, to select for the good in a sense? So that resonates a lot because like these people that you're talking about, they know not what they do. Like they don't have a compass that they're following that they want to create evil structures. They're being leveraged in a sense by an ideology that they're not aware of uh, that is, you know, extracting resources and building disintegrating technology in a sense in the name of uh, bringing people together. You know, Facebook's whole yeah. motto is that, uh, you know, bring mm -hmm. connecting the world. It's like, mm -hmm. so yeah, man. Um, yeah. This last few minutes, if you want to just go uh, tell us about, your uh, manifesto project and how to find it and what, what are the benefits and what are some kind of, some of the outcomes that you've seen mm -hmm. from it? Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what we have a mission, which is to restore man and doing it through that exact way that we've spoken about it. It starts with basically creating an environment where men can come uh, and where we can, talk freely and be men together, but not have to compete with each other for attention and space, uh, but be accepted the way we are. Uh, and then we believe in that as we do that, we, we, we have a value of challenging and inspiring each other. So we, 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 we believe that disagreement is okay. <laughs> and it's not a safe space in that way, right? We respect mm -hmm. each other, but we also challenge each other to, to bring out better. It's, it's not a Christian organization. It's a, it's a, we have Buddhists and Taoists and we have a Zoroastrian uh, who is a philosopher and influences a lot of stuff that we're doing. Um, and, and we believe that by doing that, we grow in discernment. A lot of mm -hmm. basic truths and ideas of reality have been lost. So that, that helps us to grow in discernment. And as we grow in discernment, we also grow in character. We stop just being copies of trends and ideas and repeating other things, but we, we learn to be truth speakers uh, to each other. And, and that creates a strong force where, where there's space for multiplicity, like lots of different types of men, any kind of men you wanna be, as long as you can handle being with us. Um, and, and a lot of diversity as, uh, and a lot of unity as well in, 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 in that we're centered around a purpose. Um, so, so Manifesto Core has online men's groups where guys meet every single week. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the groups have daily buddy calls with each other guys where you're basically holding each other accountable to be reaching the goals that you want to achieve. So if you say like, I want to start a new business, then there's someone here that's going to say like, well, what do you need to do to start that business? <laughs> and, and what are the next yeah. steps that you need to take? And are you actually doing what you said like last month, this month as well? Uh, to continue your progress towards that. Uh, we, we work with forming habits. So we have habits around a daily practice, around your uh, relations with other people and around purpose. Um, and then we have like themes of the month where we did work with like this, this month we're working with anger. Uh, and so it's all about, we, that's why we're talking about beauty and the beast uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and talking about how to channel anger in a, in a good and productive way uh, and, and also work with assertiveness. Uh, we have, yeah, we have next, next week we're going to be talking about assertiveness and passive aggression, I think. Uh, so those are the themes we have. And then we have uh, our big yearly event that we put on. We used to do more regular, smaller events, but uh, some of them have been difficult with Corona, but we're, we're planning now. We've already sold. I think 54 tickets for the European men's gathering this year. It's happening in Denmark. Uh, as I said, Jonathan is, uh said, yes, he, he would like to come. Um, and uh, along with 30 other teachers, and we're a crew of like 60 guys that put on the whole event. The topic of the event is the death of the patriarchs. Mm. Um, and we're, we do rituals. Uh, so we're going to have a ritual for the death of the patriarchs. Uh, and, oh. and we, we dive into the story somehow and we experience it. And so it's really much built on the hero's journey of like a call to adventure and uh, a descent into the abyss uh, and, and an, an experience together with another group of guys that can really help us to see ourselves in a new light. Uh, and then we put everything together again at the end um uh with a reintegration uh so so yeah that's that's what we've been doing we've been doing it for for five years now um four and a half years uh with the european men's gathering um yeah so manifesto.com with a ph as you can see it there so not with an f but with a ph um that's where one can read more about what we're doing here 
Yeah, really wonderful. I really, really love that. And I think you're, uh, I'm, I'm inspired by these conversations that I have because there are people that are creating solutions or attempting to and, and doing great work. And you're not going to see this advertised in, on any kind of you know, mainstream sources. So uh, yeah. I see a lot of networks being built, a lot of community being built all throughout the world through conversations and, and entities like you're building there. So it's um, anything I can do to share that and kind of be a, be a part of that. I wish you success with it. And I'm going to link to it um, in the description here. I'll link to your channel and to the uh, Manifesto website. And um, Paul, man, it was, I appreciate it a lot. I really enjoyed our, our conversation here very much. It was really, really enjoyable. Thank you, James. Uh, it was yeah. great. I think we should maybe try to switch the roles another time and I can dig a little bit more into your, your story. And your yeah, past. man. Anytime, let me know. Okay, great. All right, man. Thank you. Thanks so God much, bless. James. Yep, yeah. take care.